If you say no when the organized interest groups come out and demand higher taxes, you say no, um, then it's going to take longer for them to come back and say, we have to have this because they've been told no and the world didn't end and they didn't get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so giving in to the tax and spenders by giving them more money uh, just encourages them to keep coming back for more money. Uh, the politicians always hear all the voices that want higher taxes and they don't hear voices from people who are busy working and not lobbying the state legislature right. or Congress. And so they always get a incorrect sense of where, quote unquote, the people are, because the people who come to their office every day are a subsection of a subset of a sliver mm -hmm. <laughs> of the entire sure. electorate. Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. Well, thank you for joining us for another edition of Americans for Prosperity's American Potential. Today's guest started his advocacy group in 1985 at the request of my political hero, President Ronald Reagan. The group works to limit the size and cost of government and opposes higher taxes at every level while supporting tax reform that would be one rate paid once and based on how much you purchase. He holds an MBA and a BA in economics, both from Harvard University. He served on multiple boards as well as being a contributing editor to the American Spectator magazine. He's authored four books, and he has been the economist and chief speechwriter for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He's been the executive director for the National Taxpayer Union and the College Republicans. He has many other accomplishments that I didn't get to, but I'd like to welcome our guest, Grover Norquist, who's the president of Americans for Tax Reform. Well, Grover, it's, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. You have been in this fight for so long. It's mm -hmm. just, it's incredible to have you as such a warrior. I do want to ask you though, I heard that you have competed three times in a comedy fundraiser, Washington's Funniest Celebrity, and you won it once. I have. Is I, that right? I competed about 10 times and I won it once. <laughs> okay. So what's the best you got? What, what's the best joke you, what got you the win? Uh, well, I have an opening line that gets you <laughs> on stage three laughs in 10 seconds. Be, but when midgets play miniature golf, do they know? <laughs> and they st people start giggling at midgets because they know that something they're going to get in trouble politically correct <laughs> wise. That's um, great. But yeah, that's, uh, it, it's fun. I, I've worked uh, the uh, LA comedy uh, store as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. That's, I think that's a fun thing for folks to know about you. You've been in this fight since Ronald Reagan was yep. president of the United mm -hmm. States. Um, and we talk about Washington all the time and Americans for tax reform does great work there. But was just listening to your presentation here, you were talking about a lot of the states and the movement of many states now going to a, to a, a, a single rate tax and yes. how important that is. And I heard your comments about it's hard to fidget with that. And that's yeah. really what we need is to protect the tax code from being played with by politicians, isn't it? In, a, the, in the 50 states, there's seven states that have no income tax, no state income tax. And people are familiar with Florida and Tennessee and Texas as the larger ones. Washington State, um, South Dakota, Alaska, uh, Nevada. But uh, in addition to that, there are another 12 states that have a single rate tax. Okay. Um, everybody, it's not a graduated or progressive income tax, it's a single rate tax. And the advantage of those 12 states is that if a politician wants to raise taxes, this includes Illinois. Illinois, by constitution, has a single rate tax. And if you wish to raise the income tax in Illinois, you have to raise it on everybody in the state. And politicians much prefer to say, I have a graduated income tax, and this week we only raise taxes on the very rich, right. and later I'll come back for the various other um, groups of people to go after. Uh, and that, so you can raise taxes on people one at a time. 
We we're going to tax rich people. Then we we're going to tax this kind of people and boom, 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 boom. And after a while, everybody's taxes went up, right. but you didn't pick on them all at once. <laughs> a single rate tax, what you have to do right. is raise taxes um, on everybody at once. And that's where you can lose an election. And so politicians don't like single rate taxes. I like them because they're easy to reduce. We're cutting everybody's taxes. Good. And they're difficult to raise. I'm raising everybody's tax. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm from, my home state is Colorado. Yes. It's the home of the mm -hmm. Taxpayer Bill of Rights. I've always been a big fan of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. We've got a Supreme Court that's kind of eroding mm -hmm. the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, calling taxes fees. We've had some Republicans who went along with that and, and, and called uh, tax a fee. Overall, what is the thought of a, of a Taxpayer Bill of Rights? I mean, we've always tried to export that to other states. We haven't been real successful at it. Uh, Tabor, Colorado, um, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, a spending limit, is an extremely good idea. California had one, and unfortunately, Republican governor poked a hole in it and said, well, we won't count education, as if that's spent, which is half of spending. Right. So it really was damaging. to Cal California wouldn't be in the position it was if they'd kept their Tabor, the Gann Amendment, is what they called theirs after Paul Gann. Uh, there are other states that have similar versions of that, and there are 12 states now that are phasing their income tax down to zero, and they do it with a version of Tabor, of a spending limit. They'll say, here's our plan spending. When revenue comes up above what we were planning to spend in any given year, some of it we might give to the teachers unions, <laughs> but the rest of it will go into a income tax cut. So the re revenue doesn't come in and um, the government doesn't grow. And N North Carolina has been taking their income tax rate down for 10 years now mm -hmm. uh, with this ratchet. Every time revenue comes in above planned spending, income tax rate goes down again and again and again. Uh, they've done that every year for 10, 10 years now. They're now planning on phasing it all the way down to 2.5% and then eventually to zero. Uh, and their corporate income tax disappears in about two years. So they're phasing down their personal and their corporate income tax. Mm -hmm. It's been very important. So one of the advantages states have that the federal government doesn't is a balanced budget requirement in many of yeah. the states, right? And uh, you... you back in the Reagan years and before tr really pushed for a convention of the states so that yeah. we could have a balanced budget amendment at the federal level. Uh, that's really one of the problems, right? That uh, at the federal level is that anytime they just need something, they can go raise revenue. They can go spend money without yeah. having the, the, the money there to spend. Yeah. Uh, a Tabor or spending limit is much better than a balanced budget amendment because balanced budget, you can get to one of two ways, <laughs> spend less, Nah, says the politician. <laughs> right. Raise taxes. Oh, yeah. yes. And not only, but I have to because I have a balanced budget amendment. <laughs> so um, I like the balanced budget amendments that have been put forward in Washington that include a two-thirds vote to ever raise taxes. Mm -hmm. And that's something that California put in, two-thirds vote to raise taxes. Uh, it's three-quarters in Arkansas, which is even better than two-thirds. Mm -hmm. uh, number of states require, to, Nevada requires a two-thirds vote to raise taxes. Uh, you want to make it difficult to raise taxes because taxes are about as permanent as constitutional amendments. They almost never go away. It's a lot of work to get rid of one. Right. Uh, it's easier to amend the Constitution than to get rid of a sure. tax. Uh, and, and so spending limits, balanced budget amendments attached to a spending limit is a great idea. Uh, we we have so many uh, folks around the country that that seem to play with the play with the numbers. Politicians love it. You kind of alluded to it there. I didn't get into this business to to not give money away to my friends. Yeah. Um, how, how do we? Uh, we're so far after COVID. I mean, we're spending so much more money. We ratcheted up spending in Washington D.C. We just seem so far away from a balanced budget in the federal government. How do we ever get there? Uh, because the way entitlements are structured, they say everybody who fits this description will give money to each year. And then a thousand more people show up that fit that description and the budget goes up and there was no vote in Congress to do that. Uh, so entitlements are dangerous because they can grow like Topsy mm -hmm. and uh, very rarely shrink, not that Topsy did. But uh, this I think is, 
is can be fixed by block granting to the 50 states the money the government was going to spend on Medicaid or food stamps or job training programs uh, uh, or various other means-tested programs mm -hmm. where um, you didn't do anything for the money, you just shut up and said, I'm poor, and they gave it to you. If you send it to the states and then the 50 states say, we'll handle it, and you say, we're going to send it to you and we're going to allow it to grow, the total to grow a little less than the wages of the American people, not more than the wages of the American mm -hmm. people. So people living on welfare are not going to get bigger raises than people working. Well, you do that over time uh, and you bend the cost curve down. And uh, one of the numbers when Paul Ryan was doing it with the specific version he had it, you'd save $6 trillion over a decade. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and it's a permanent set of reductions ratcheting down. Uh, you take that out over 10, 20, 50 years, all of the horror stories about what happens in 10, 20, 50 years become manageable. As a matter of fact, you can end up paying down the national debt with simply that level of, of restriction of growth. It, each of these things would still grow a little bit, just not as rapidly as people's wages, their ability to pay taxes, and their individual income. Uh, that is the model that is four times past the House of Representatives, and at least once, maybe twice, in the Senate. But it was done during a period where Democrats controlled the presidency. So it didn't become law, but it did show that you could vote for that and not be labeled as anti-poor person. Right. Uh, nobody lost an election because of those votes. And I think that was very powerful. So yeah. I think we can do, we came within one vote of doing it for Obamacare and Medicaid, block granting it to the states. Uh, but uh, John McCain flipped at the yes. last minute without telling anybody he changed his mind. And so we lost by one vote. Well, that tells you, you had a very uh, modest Republican majority then. Uh, that you don't need 60 votes with reconciliation. You really only need 50 in the Senate and a simple majority in the House. But then you have to hold everybody together or 52, yeah. 53 and lose a couple. Um, that is eventually how we will fix this, uh, assuming we can get a Republican House, Senate, and presidency in the near future. You have a, an optimism that that I think belies your time with Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. about this. And that, that, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, I think, look, Reagan made the case and he got a Democratic Congress to vote to take uh, the personal income tax rates down by 25%, yeah. just as uh, uh, John F. Kennedy had done. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, voters recognized the importance of that. And then in just uh, five years later, the entire House and Senate, with overwhelming support among Democrats, um, voted to cut the top rate to 27% and the second rate at 15 so you had two rates. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, George Herbert Walker Bush started unraveling it, and Clinton made it worse, and Obama made it worse, um, and so it's drifted back up again. But America saw the success of two, 15 and 27% rates. Why would we live with a 37, 43% right. top rate as the Ds are talking about? What do you say to, so Americans for Tax Reform has a pledge yes. that they ask candidates to take. Uh, I signed it back when I ran for yes. Congress and, and was proud to do so. And still to this day, you know, would sign it again if I, if I ran. But there are a growing number of people running for office and business leaders and others who say, well, that's crazy. What if you have to raise taxes? And what do you say to people who, who say that and make that argument? Well, if you're going to run as a Republican, 90% of Republicans take the pledge, um, more than that. Uh, it really is the parties endorse the pledge. Reagan took the pledge. All the presidential candidates have taken the pledge. All the leadership in the House and the Senate have mm -hmm. taken the pledge. Uh, the Republican leadership is not suicidal. They will not ask their members to vote for a tax increase, knowing that it would destroy the careers and lives of many of their uh, right. caucus. Uh, and raising taxes has become toxic within the modern Republican Party. Uh, at, and this is true at the state level as well. Two-thirds of all Republican governors have taken a pledge, I'll veto any tax increase. Mm -hmm. uh, quite a number of the state legislators have made that commitment as well. Uh, so in red states, they're not raising taxes. Blue states raise taxes. Red states don't. 
um, between governors and state legislators as a line in the sand uh, against tax increases. There have been, uh, Alabama raised the gas tax a few years ago. That was a mistake. Uh, but you can remember them because they're so few. Yeah. Uh, in most Republican states, they're busy cutting the tax, including phasing it down towards zero in a single rate. Uh, and as soon as you get to a single rate on the income tax, you make it very difficult to impossible for anyone to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. Without the voters noticing and and being very them out. mad at yeah. you. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I, I have likened the a tax increase to sort of taking the lid off of the boiling pot, right? We've got uh, maybe a clamor for spending cuts. Government's too big. We're going to have a deficit. And then politicians can come along, p take the pot, the, the lid off of the pot, and then the boiling simmers down. Yeah. Do, is, isn't that true? I mean, that's one of the most dangerous things about tax increases is it just allows us to grow government. It, it does. And it doesn't end the clamor for more taxes and spending, it strengthens it. Right. If you say no, when the organized interest groups come out and demand higher taxes, you say no, um, then it's gonna take longer for them to come back and say, we have to have this, because they've been told no, and the world didn't end, and they didn't get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so giving in to the tax and spenders by giving them more money uh, just encourages them to keep coming back. For more money. Uh, the politicians always hear all the voices that want higher taxes, and they don't hear voices from people who are busy working and not lobbying the state legislature right. or Congress. And so they always get a difficult, an incorrect sense of where, quote unquote, the people are, because the people who come to their office every day are a subsection of a subset of a sliver mm -hmm. <laughs> of the entire sure. electorate. And uh, people, oh my gosh, everybody tells me this. We saw this in Iowa, where a bunch of Republican legislators voted against school choice. And they said to the governor, oh, our constituents hate this. They tell me every day. Well, then the governor of uh, Iowa primaried 10 Republican legislators from rural areas who believed that they were hearing the voice of the people right. telling them, no, nine of the 10 lost. Hmm. And the 10th one said, I, I quit. I'm on your team now. Yeah. So th th these are smart enough to get elected people who didn't recognize that when everybody that talked to them had one viewpoint, it was they, they were hearing from just one side of the <laughs> argument. Sure. Other people didn't bother to drive in or fly in to, to talk to them in the state legislature. Uh, and they cost them their seat. So, I mean, they, mm -hmm. they were, they, they really believed they were doing the will of right. the people, but they got a false sense of it because paid lobbyists with bullhorns sound louder than yeah. people at home sure. who don't come to visit you. Right. Um, that's, the, that's the value and the beauty, I think, of the ATR pledge, though, mm -hmm. too, right, is that it 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 allows people to know where you are and where you stand, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it really I think ferrets folks out and uh, and shows voters right. And it allows an elected official. I'd love to help you. That's a great idea. I can't raise taxes, but if you show me some other way to cut spending, we could fit you in. Yeah. But you've got to go push somebody else away from the table. Yeah. Uh, at which point, the person may find that's not of interest to them. <laughs> Okay, well, here's what I love. I appreciate your your time coming over. I love your yeah. optimism oh, because we're win. Yeah. It, it's hard to find that these days. I think a lot of uh, a lot of the conservative movement and others are sort of like, "Woe is us!" You know, what mm -hmm. do we do? And and we see government, you know, ever increasing. You see the Green New Deal and all of that. Yeah. So it's great to have someone who's who's got a positive view and a positive outlook. We went from three percent of GDP spent by the federal government up to twenty percent or more that that took 62 years to happen okay uh we're not going to take it back down towards three in a week or two mm -hmm. or even a couple of years yeah but you're still optimistic oh, yes. about america oh, yeah. and federalism no, no. and Look, all that stuff a, 
If we were in Bulgaria, I probably wouldn't be optimistic, but we're not. <laughs> we're in America. We're not. That Ronald Reagan optimism. Grover, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. Good to be us. with you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thanks. Well, I love the excitement and the positivity of Grover Norquist. That, you know what? That comes from Ronald Reagan, and you can almost see it in him. And all these years, Grover Norquist has been doing this battle for, for liberty and for prosperity of the American people, trying to help uh, keep taxes low, that, that barrier. I mean, high taxes are a barrier. Excessively high taxes are a barrier to the American people. And Grover Norquist has been a warrior on this issue for, for decades now. And I remember, in fact, when we started the interview, I told him I wouldn't have recognized him because he didn't have a beard. He had a beard for all these years. Uh, and I met him so many years ago. My, I signed the pledge in 2008 in 2010 when I was a candidate. So uh, Grover Norquist has been around a long time and I think the American people owe Grover Norquist an awful lot for his diligence in trying to keep all of us free. Thanks for listening to American Potential. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.